And yet, thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this uh, symposium. It's been a fantastic uh, day, um, really tremendous series of talks and uh, only further increased my excitement to be spending more time down this side of the river um, as from later this year and that of our group. Um, our group is a, a truly translational group. We uh, extend all the way from uh, basic science, fundamental neuroscience, right through to, uh, to clinical trials, cohort studies and, uh, and uh, um, health practice change. Um, but fundamentally, I'm a clinician, and, uh, and so the questions that our group address, whether it's um, in our basic science or in our clinical studies, are driven by, um, by clinical questions that uh, I see in my patients in my practice. Um, and, uh, and for, for me, uh, the, the disease of particular interest is, uh, is epilepsy. Um, and epilepsy is an ancient condition. It has been with humanity as long as there has been recorded, uh, recorded writings. Um, but there's been few diseases that have been so misunderstood, feared um, and stigmatised over, over the uh, millennia. Epilepsy, in fact, is not actually a disease. It's a, a collection of different brain conditions that are all characterised by, um, by recurrent, unprovoked uh, epileptic seizures. Um, and that can be genetic or it can be acquired. Um, and because there are so many different brain diseases that result in epilepsy, it means that our research group has become interested in uh, many other related conditions, as Stephen alluded to in his, uh, his introduction, in particular brain trauma, uh, brain tumours, stroke, um, and uh, neurodegenerative conditions, all of which are commonly uh, result in epilepsy. As a group, the epilepsies are the most common serious chronic neurological condition globally. Uh, one in 10, almost one in 10 people, so that's and many people in this room will suffer a seizure at some point in their lifetime. Um, and uh, up to 4% up to will uh, fulfil the definition of epilepsy, which means having, uh, having recurrent unprovoked seizures. Um, and at any one time, up to 1% of the population will have active epilepsy, having had a seizure in the last five years or requiring ongoing anti-epileptic medication. Furthermore, it's more than just seizures. Um, it, epilepsy is commonly accompanied by, um, by serious medical and psychiatric comorbidities, which greatly increase the, uh, the burden of the disease. Um, and as I've already alluded to, there's much disability, um, psychosocial disadvantage and stigma. And we're increasingly recognising that it's not just a disabling disease, but it's also a fatal disease in many cases. Overall, ep epilepsy um, has a three times increase in, uh, uh, in, in standardised mortality rates across the, uh, the age spectrum. But when you look at drug resistant epilepsy, it goes up, uh, up to 20 times. And the risk of dying suddenly, we heard about sudden death from ca sudden cardiac death earlier in, the, uh, um, in the, uh, the talk. But in fact, the most common cause of sudden unexplained death in young people is epilepsy. It's 40 times increased from the, uh, from the general population. In some ways, in the epilepsy uh, um, field, um, compared to other areas of neurology, um, and I know when I was th first thinking of going into neurology as a young, uh, as a young uh, registrar, I was uh, told by, uh, by many colleagues, don't do neurology, all you do is uh, stamp collect and you can't actually treat anything. But in epilepsy, we have had effective treatments in terms of at least seizure control in a proportion of people going right back to the bromides in the, uh, in the 1860s. Um, and over the last uh, th three decades, there's been an absolute explosion of new drugs that have come onto the market to treat epilepsy. However, these new drugs have really made little impact in the major treatment gaps in epilepsy. Um, and, uh, and these are drug-resistant epilepsy. Uh, about, uh, about a third of patients who, uh, who have epilepsy are unable to have their seizures controlled by all of those many different medications I showed in the previous slide. And in fact, once, as I was telling Steve at breakfast this morning, once you have failed two anti-epileptic drugs, the chance that uh, you're trialling the other 15 will actually bring your seizures under control is, uh, is less than 4%, in the range of 1% to 4%. So you're on a major losing wicket. And that proportion of drug-resistant epilepsy has not changed over three decades. If you have drug-resistant epilepsy, you've got a major increased risk of injury, of mortality, um, and of uh, impaired quality of life. 
Most of our anti-epileptic drugs have to be taken chronically um, and, they're, and up to 90% of patients report at least some side effects um, and with the 30 to 40% of patients having side effects are serious enough to have to change the medication. There's been some improvement with the medications in terms of tolerability, but uh, essentially not a major improvement. The key one, the one which I'll focus um, most of our talk on, but it's because it's been a, a major area of our research, is trying to identify true disease modifying treatments um, that actually either prevent or reverse or mitigate the, uh, the severity of the epilepsy. Currently, all those drugs I showed in the slide before are purely symptomatic. They suppress the seizures while you have a reasonable blood level in your system in two thirds of people, but they do nothing to change the underlying course of the condition, do nothing to prevent the condition, and, uh, and do uh, nothing to mitigate it. And finally, in another area that's been a, a major focus of our work is the comorbidities. And I mentioned that these are common, up to, uh, to 40 to 50% of patients with epilepsy, particularly with drug resistant epilepsy, um, and there we have no treatments that are specifically directed towards comorbidities. So I've been on a, uh, a one of the co-chairs of an International League Against Epilepsy uh, um, uh, uh, task force, which has been uh, given the, uh, the brief to try and understand why, despite the billions and billions of dollars and all these new drugs that have come onto the market, we really haven't impacted on the, uh, the gaps in care um, significantly over, the, over the, last, uh, the last 100 years, and particularly the last 30 years. And we believe a lot of it lies in the way preclinical research has been done in epilepsy. Essentially, the same formula has been followed that uh, Merritt and Pup Putnam used in the 1940s to identify phenytoin or, uh, or, uh, or dilantin. And that is screening rodent models of acute seizures. Not animals that spontaneously seize, so not animals that actually have epilepsy, but animals that when you give them a toxin or electric shock, they have a seizure, and you, you screen them with various compounds and you look to see how the, which drugs reduced the, the threshold for inducing a seizure in these animals. And this has been very effective at discovering drugs that are anti-seizure drugs and control seizures in two thirds of people, but essentially, despite different mechanisms of action, they've had the same clinical spectrum. What the field is now recognising um, and uh, is a major plank of, of, of our research platform is that what you need to be doing is actually studying animals who truly have epilepsy. Um, and that's animals who either through genetic mutations or through acquired injuries such as traumatic brain injuries have recurrent unprovoked seizures. And actually looking at how you suppress seizures in these models, how you modify the, uh, the underlying uh, epilepsy, uh, prevent the epilepsy and the comorbidities. Um, however, these studies are much more um, labour intensive, expensive and require facilities to, uh, to monitor animals over long periods of time, which as Stephen knows is uh, quite an infrastructure investment to be able to do these sort of studies. So they're not the easy screening studies that uh, the field has used. And the other thing is that unlike in clinical practice where we like to compare established drug with a new drug, in the preclinical sphere that hasn't been done, not in epilepsy. All they've done is look for drugs that are effective anti-seizure drugs in these acute models and then uh, develop them through the clinical program. And the endpoints that they use in preclinical studies have not been um, directed by the gaps in care that I mentioned um, and have not, been, uh, have not been the focus of the studies. Of the, of the area that the, the, the four major gaps that I identified, the one that I've already alluded to that uh, we believe is uh, absolutely critical is the, uh, the lack of anti-epileptogenic or disease modifying treatments. Um, and I'll outline some of the reasons why um, if we were able to, uh, to, to develop something like this, which we currently don't have, it could really be transformational. The present, because all drugs are symptomatic, patients need to take, uh, and, and epilepsy is a chronic condition, in many cases, lifelong condition, patients need to take their anti-epileptic drugs multiple times a day, every day. If they miss a tablet, they're just as likely to have a seizure as if they never took one in the first place. Um, and not surprisingly, medication adherence, good medication adherence, is really, really difficult. Uh, and it is the and poor adherence is the major reason for seizure recurrence in many patients and is associated with increased death rates, injury rates, hospital admissions. The other problem is if you're taking a drug all your life, often from uh, teenage years, uh, 
that uh, the, 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 uh, the, the prospect of long-term side effects uh, becomes an issue. And we now know, following patients longer term, that many problems can develop, likely related to drugs, bone disease, gait imbalances, fracture, obesity, metabolic syndromes, etc. Thirdly is if you're a woman and you want to have a family, um, and you can't just stop your anti-epileptic drugs because uh, you'll risk going into major seizures which has risks to you, your unborn child and to, uh, and to the rest of society um, and uh, other children. And we know that, and this has been a major focus of our clinical work running the Australian, Epilep Australian Pregnancy Register, uh, which is a national register that we run through our group, that uh, ant all the anti-epileptic drugs are associated with the increased risk of birth defects, neurocognitive problems and even autism spectrum disorder. So, and furthermore, if we are able to develop an anti-epileptic treatment, it would address most of those other issues. Firstly, you could, if it's effective enough, you could potentially cure or prevent epilepsy. Um, even if you don't cure it, by just reducing the severity of the epilepsy, the, you, could, you could make take someone from being drug resistant, that one third that are drug resistant and not controlled with current medications, to drug sensitive. You could reduce the number of medications the patients require, therefore the potential for long-term side effects. And we now have this understanding that the neurocognitive and neuropsychiatric side effects are not just an add-on from the psychosocial issues of having epilepsy, but actually are an integral part of the disease process itself in many cases. And so a disease-modifying treatment would potentially reduce the comorbidities. So this is why it's often termed as the holy grail in translational epilepsy research. And we do know this concept is actually correct because uh, I, was, I kept saying we don't have a disease modifying treatment in epilepsy. Well, we don't have a medical disease modifying treatment, but we do actually have a disease modifying treatment. Our friendly neurosurgeons, if we can uh, localise the uh, region that seizures come from and uh, remove that with epilepsy surgery, then we can result in cure or decrease drug resistance, reduce medication burden, and decrease psychiatric comorbidities are all seen in patients with successful epilepsy surgery, and which are associated with many improvements in patients' outcomes. What, however, only a very small proportion of all drug resistant patients are suitable for epilepsy surgery, and so what we really would like to do is achieve the same thing with a medical treatment. However, developing anti-epileptic medications is a lot more difficult than just developing anti-seizure medications. Um, I've already alluded to in the preclinical sphere, you need to have long-term um, uh, capacity for long-term monitoring of, uh, of animals to see if you actually alter the long-term course and facilities to look at comorbidities, etc., chronic EEG recordings. And it's true once you translate into human clinical trials, it's not just a matter of doing a, a four-month uh, anti-seizure trial. You need to, if you want to do a post-traumatic epilepsy trial, for example, you need to follow patients after a brain injury for at least a year or two and see how many develop epilepsy. So these studies are very expensive. There's a lot of noise um, and therefore not surprising, a lot of barriers um, to, uh, to, to companies, particularly pharmaceutical industry, wanting to fund the studies. Just to stylistically understand what, what the issue is, um, this is, a, this is a, a diagram um, uh, from a review article which, uh, which, which talks about what epileptogenesis is from a, uh, from a conceptual point of view. Every, we all have a seizure threshold. Everybody in this room, given the right insult, could have a seizure. But normally, our baseline level of brain excitability is well below that. So we don't seize unless we go out and do something silly at a party or, uh, or uh, someone bangs into us in the football field. However, after an epileptic brain insult, such as a head injury or, or a febrile convulsion, cerebral infection, et cetera, or if you inherit a genetic mutation, the, there are a series of uh, metabolic and functional neurobiological changes which evolve over often many years. Uh, the median time for developing epilepsy after a brain injury is one to two years. Um, and uh, that brings the seizure threshold down to the point where the normal fluctuations that occur in brain excitability through the day start to produce spontaneous recurrent seizures. So what we want to try and do is to um, is to target some of these, uh, these processes um, to try and um, modify that, uh, re that, uh, that reduction in seizure threshold or to actually, in the, even better, in someone who has established epilepsy, to, uh, to increase seizure thresholds so spontaneous only seizures don't occur. Uh, 
And this is where these, our friends, the, uh, the, uh, the rats and mice and the chronic the true epilepsy uh, models are really important. Now there are many, many biological processes that occur during this, uh, this epileptogenic period um, and we really don't have any very good idea yet which ones are critical um, and which ones can be targeted. Um, but, but the studies in animal models allow you to do that and then look to see you modify the, uh, the, the outcome. Now I'm just going to talk about one which has been a, a focus of, uh, of our group um, because it gives an illustration about how the field and, uh, and our group in particular is approaching this problem. So we, we're targeting a uh, protein called tau and a particularly an isoform of tau, hyperphosphorylated tau. Uh, microtubules and neurons which are, are important in transmitting uh, um, uh, uh, nutrients down the, uh, the axone. However, when it becomes hyperphosphorylated, which can happen from a brain insult or from um, in part of a neurodegenerative disease, it, beca it, it's, it becomes insoluble and forms these clumps or tangles, which are neurotoxic. Um, and we know that this is an important part of the pathogenesis of Alzheimer's disease and other neurodegenerative diseases, post-traumatic brain injury, um, chronic uh, concussive, uh, traumatic encephalopathy, for example, in the, in the chronically uh, concussed uh, NFL players. But there's also increasing evidence from our group and others that this is an important uh, process in acquired epilepsis. And uh, a group uh, at, in the Department of Surgery at uh, Royal Melbourne Hospital, led by uh, Chris Hovens, um, about a decade ago, discovered that this particular salt of selenium, sodium selenate, had a very specific effect to upregulate um, the enzyme PP2A, which acts to dephosphorylate tau. And tau exists in this homeostasis between dephosphorylated tau, which is its stable form in microtubules, and phosphorylated tau, which is its, its, its uh, insoluble form that causes tangles and uh, um, neurodegeneration. Brain insult, you get increased kinases and increased uh, phosphorylation. You activate PP2A, you have the reverse effect. And they showed in, uh, in animal models that it was highly protective in neurodegenerative diseases. It's now with us and others as translated into clinical trials in that area. Um, but we were interested um, in our group whether the same process could be uh, effective in, uh, in, uh, in, in being anti-epileptic therapy. Now to cut a large, a large body of work short, this is a paper that we had published last year in Brain um, where we, we tested this in uh, three epilepsy models, megalokinling, post canic acid status and post-traumatic um, brain injury model. Uh, and in all three models, it was anti epileptogenic Now, I'm just going to show the last one just to, to illustrate how this, this, uh, this paradigm um, is, works. And this is work that's been led by uh, Sanders Sh Andy Schultz, who is one of our senior group leaders, um, who has a history as a, uh, a professional ice hockey player, which is how he got interested in traumatic brain injury, mainly by inflicting it on other people, I'm told, but that's another story. Um, and uh, and um, traumatic brain injury is actually a common cause of acquired epilepsy um, and, uh, um, and one that there is a potential obvious intervention because the patients come with the insult to, uh, to hospital and you can intervene early. Um, Sandy um, developed um, or, or adapted a uh, model called the fluid percussion injury model um, which is uh, using a small craniotomy, you deliver a fluid pulse, um, pressure pulse to the, uh, the epidural space of the brain. It delivers a combination of both local injury and a diffuse, uh, um, diffuse uh, brain injury, um, which resembles pathologically uh, very much the site, sort of an injury you'd get with a closed head injury from a car accident, for example. So we, um, we took rats and uh, gave them a fluid percussion injury um, and then treated them for 16 weeks with uh, sodium selenate uh, via osmotic pumps and we did serial MRI scans um, to evaluate brain ap uh, atrophy. We looked, did behavioural testing to look at uh, neurocognitive comorbidities and we did video chronic video EEG recording for two weeks while the drug was still going, gave a two week washout and then another two weeks of recording to look at disease modification. Um, starting with the epilepsy, so when we looked at uh, uh, using 20 for, uh, two weeks of continuous video EEG monitoring and measured how many seizures per day they occurred in the vehicle versus uh, salinate treated animals, there were significantly not less seizures in the, the pre-washout period um, and, the, and the seizures were significantly shorter. Oops. When we repeated this in the, uh, the post-washout two week recording, 
um, there had been an increase in the number of seizures in the, uh, in the, uh, um, the vehicle treated group, but ag again significantly less seizures in the, uh, uh, in the salinate treated group, indicating a true disease modifying effect on the epilepsy. Um, and and the, again, the trend for the, uh, for the seizures to be significantly shorter. But it wasn't just the, um, the seizures themselves. I mentioned that epilepsy has many associated features and brain atrophy and is one of them. And we, this is an area where, where in vivo imaging can be really valuable because in the same animal you can follow over time the progressive brain atrophy that occurs after a traumatic brain injury or other insult. And you can see um, in the mouse, the, this, the white areas of ventricles, how you've got increasing ventricle size, reflecting increasing brain atrophy that progresses over the three months, indicating that the traumatic brain injury really has sets up a, new, a chronic neurodegenerative process. Um, when you treat with selenate, targeting the hyperphosphorylated tau, you get a you don't get complete protection, but you get a significant a mitigation of that atrophy. So the atrophy by three months is significantly less, and you can see this in the volumetric measurements, than it is in the um, in the vehicle treated groups. Um, and these are the sham treated treated groups, which uh, are obviously um, better than the uh, selenate group, but uh, the difference is uh, is uh, is still quite dramatic between the treated and not treated group. We also, using, uh, using MRI, were able to look at white matter structure and integrity uh, with uh, diffusion ten tensor imaging. And these are some fabulous I images that David Wright, who's also coming across and will run the new good advertisement to run the new 9.4 Tesla MRI scan that's going to go on the bottom of the baker. And with this, you can reconstruct the tracks of the brain. And these are the main white matter tracks of the brain. Um, and you can see this is the fluid percussion three months um, with vehicle, major disruption in the white matter tracks quantified down here. Sodium selenate, that's not the same as vehicle, but is significantly better. And if you look at the actual quantification of both the track density and the number of tracks, it really is much closer to the, the sham injured animals than it is to the, uh, the vehicle treated animals. This is a clinical trial that uh, our group led in, led in Alzheimer's disease, where we also used diffusion tensor MRI scans to uh, to over six months, uh, with six months of treatment to look at uh, changes in degeneration and those uh, in white matter tracks. And again, we saw those that were treated with placebo or low dose, nutritional dose sodium selenate had a significant over six months deterioration in their white matter tracks where those were treated with sodium selenate uh, did not. This indicated the safety and tolerability as well as proof of concept of uh, sodium selenate in a clinical disease and has really led the way for what is a very large NIH-funded uh, study, which uh, is uh, uh, $25 million uh, from uh, a congressionally uh, indicated uh, uh, or driven uh, um, project to try and crack this epilepsis nut that I talked about. And our group here in Melbourne is one of, uh, one of uh, seven groups um, worldwide, um, plus a number of clinical centres that are, that are in this. Um, it has four, three major projects, two are preclinical and one is clinical. Um, the, the, of the, the preclinical project, project two is looking at screening um, different potential anti drugs and then put them, epileptogenic drugs and then putting them into a large multi-centre 180 animal uh, preclinical trial and sodium selenate is one of four drugs that have been selected for that. Uh, and the clinical study which will be run here in the ICU um, and, as well as Royal Melbourne, um, it were looking at biomarkers that will eventually help us plan a, a clinical trial. So, just to conclude, the traditional drug discovery paradigm for epilepsy, while it's been highly successful at uh, producing new anti-seizure drugs, has really not generated uh, drugs with uh, major clinical advantages over the older drugs. And translational research in this field really needs to, uh, to focus on addressing the current gaps in care, not just producing new anti-seizure drugs. Um, and anti-epileptogenesis or disease modification is absolutely key to that. Uh, and there is evidence from preclinical models that this is actually possible. Um, and, um, and, uh, but the preclinical and clinical trials are much more expensive and labour intensive um, and time consuming than uh, the standard anti-seizure drugs. And so we need to focus the uh, industry and others on to actually investing in, these, in this type of paradigm. And doing the sort of multi-centre preclinical trial paradigm we took, we're going to be doing through EpiBios to generate a higher level of evidence that uh, our preclinical 
interventions are actually effective before launching on clinical trials. So just to acknowledge the many people within our group that uh, have, uh, have generated the data, um, also our collaborators um, in partner surgery and the small animal imaging facility in the Flory um, and internationally. And thank you again for inviting me and welcoming me down to this, uh, the southern part of the, the city. Thank you.